I've got a, a couple of things I want to share this morning and, uh, and have an important announcement and then also introduce uh, some people, or two people in particular. You know, it's, um, <clears throat> it's an understatement to say that we are in a very uh, challenging time, very, very difficult. And um, as I mentioned uh, before, um, I kind of say it humorously, but I really mean it. I gave up from the very first week on trying to say the right thing. Uh, but I do want to say the thing that, uh, that is faithful uh, before the Lord. And, and I want to say to you that um, I personally have not uh, ex experienced the levels of the fear of the Lord that we have experienced in the last two months in terms of the eye of the Lord uh, being on this situation, on every single person that is involved. You know, one of the things that... Uh, I was thinking about is that, you know, I went to Bible school some years ago and somehow I missed the class on uh, how to manage a situation when the founder of a ministry has allegations against them. There, there are no, <laughs> there's no books and stuff on it. And, uh, uh, but yet well, here we are uh, with the confidence that uh, the Lord's wisdom, um, again, is, is present and available uh, to everyone involved, our leadership team. Again, just everyone, I mean, there's so many people involved in this and the Lord's wisdom is available that he's a father who uh, generously gives wisdom uh, when we ask him for it. One of the things before I kind of get into just some um, preliminary thoughts and then the introduction and then the announcements, just want to um, highlight something. I was in the very uh, first week uh, we talked about the issue of the cross and the importance of the cross. Believe it or not, I got blowback on that. But yet, Paul tells us that he tells us two things. I've been walking with the Lord for 35 years and these two verses, they, um, they're, I don't know how to explain it. They, they press on me. I go, Paul, that's an intense statement for you to say this. Uh, a mature apostle, insight into the heart of God and the gospel, probably second to none. He said these two things. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I am determined to not know anything among you except for Christ and him crucified. And, um, and that is something that we're gonna have to really grab a hold of, not just in this situation, but I really believe the church, this body, the church at large is gonna have to grapple with that um, as we move forward in the hour in which we're living. The second thing that Paul says is along the same lines is in Galatians 6.14. He says, I will not boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, both of those statements are such emphatic statements. And um, I believe that one of the things that the Lord wants to do, and I believe in my heart that um, this situation is going to serve to be a, um, a training ground, as it were, as tragic as things are, to, uh, to equip our hearts and again, when I say ours, I'm just saying it's everyone involved. Uh, the understanding of the nature of the cross and what it is all about. There's so much more to this subject to the point that Paul says, I'm determined to not know anything among you except for Christ and him crucified. He says, I will not boast in anything. In other words, if I'm going to brag about something, if I'm going to... Uh, brag about something, if I'm going to expound on something, if I'm going to talk about something over and over and over and over again, he says it's going to be the cross of Jesus Christ. And that tells me that there is uh, a whole lot that is being missed related to the subject. But I want to tell you that this morning I, um, I'm very grateful. I'm grateful to the Lord. I'm grateful to the Lord for my family 
I'm grateful to the Lord for my friends. I'm grateful to the Lord for our leadership team, uh, the way that our leadership team has, I mean, just long hours every day um, seeking to navigate uh, this, this situation and to see the, uh, uh, the fragrance of Jesus uh, coming out of them and through them has been uh, nothing but remarkable and encouraging and a strength to me. My daily prayer is that the Lord would have mercy on all of us. It's my, my most prayed prayer. Lord have mercy. Mercy. I want to say a, a couple of thoughts about the cross just real quickly. There's three things that the only way that, again, this situation and really any situation is going to get overcome, it's going to be overcome through the power of the cross. And so we want to, we want to discover what that power is. Secondly, it's our confidence in the cross. And then thirdly, which is probably the most difficult one, is living out the cross. There is, a, there is an embracing of the life of the cross that is required to, again, as part of our Christian life and, and the way that we overcome the various things that, uh, that come against us. I'm grateful this morning for the cross. I'm grateful this morning for uh, the example of Jesus. I'm grateful this morning for the victory that is found in the cross, which is in itself an entire subject. I'm grateful for this, this, this spiritual family. I'm grateful for the intercessors who have uh, continued to uh, stand before the Lord and cry out for his presence and for his purposes. I'm grateful this morning. We have um, uh, some announcements to make. Um, just as a matter of, of wisdom and governance and just the growing size and the complexity of, of the crisis, uh, just along with, uh, with legal counsel and just, just the executive leadership team, just different ones, um, this, uh, I decided to hand over the management of this crisis to the executive committee of our board of, trust, uh, board of, uh, our board of directors, excuse me, which we do have, by the way. For us to hand it over to the executive committee of the board of directors, what it will do, it will allow um, our leadership team to really focus again on just the real day-to-day the -day of pastoring and leading and bringing people into a place of, of healing and, and understanding, just, just, the, just the job that we need to be doing. Because this, it's been very difficult to, to do our jobs as well as navigating these different dynamics. And so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Kurt Fuller from, if you could just stand, I don't know where you're at. It's Kurt Fuller. He is the vice chair of our board of directors. That's one, and you'll be seeing um, more of him in the days ahead. But uh, Kurt has got uh, 35 years of military experience and uh, tremendous experience in leadership and governance and, and how to navigate very, very, very complex um, situations. And so he'll be... Um, helping give oversight uh, to that process. And also, I'd like to introduce uh, Eric Volz. Eric, why don't you go ahead and come up. Eric is the uh, managing director of the David House, which is an international uh, crisis resource agency. It's uh, widely recognized by the New York Times as Eric has been involved in uh, high-profile crisis uh, cases. And, uh, and I've appointed him to be the official spokesperson for, uh, for IHOP to begin to uh, make statements and different things and so forth. And so um, he's not a stranger to um, our community. He, and in fact, I'll share a little bit more about that in just a few moments. 
but uh, he's a man um, of a prayer, but has a lot of experience of how to manage the complex and high stakes emotional uh, situations. Um, lastly, I want to say that um, uh, I've thought about this. What I'm saying is, is a, um, uh, a big sentence <laughs> to say, a statement to make. Um, and that is that um, uh, I've done my utmost best to lead this process. The, the executive leadership team has been right a part of it the entire time. And um, I can say this on behalf of the, of the executive leadership team that as it pertains to this situation, our conscience is clear. And that's the statement that I thought hard about because you don't just say that lightly. But uh, our conscience is clear. And so I just want to take a moment and, and pray and then uh, have Eric take the microphone. Father, or thank you for who you are, Lord. We say that you are the father of lights. There is no shadow in turning with you. And that you are ever so generous, Father, to, to give mercy, to give wisdom lavishly, Lord, when we ask for it. So, Father, we do ask you for your mercy. And Father, we do ask you for your wisdom. And Father, even in the next few moments, Father, as Eric shares, Lord, I just ask you for your hand, Father, to be on him. Lord, that his heart would overflow, Father, with a noble theme. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Good morning to everyone. And also for those online and around the world that feel connected to this spiritual family. As Stuart said, my name is Eric Voles. Um, I know that so much of what you guys are feeling right now is, could be described as surreal, awkward, maybe even vexing. Even having an outside spokesperson like this being introduced can feel uncomfortable, and I get it. It's a little awkward for me, too. Though I'm here in a professional capacity, I do have a personal connection to this ministry. As Stuart mentioned, I came for the first time to the International House of Prayer about seven years ago. A dear friend introduced me to the prayer movement, and I would regularly travel here to pray. It's kind of one of those business guys that would sit in the back and uh, have learned a lot here. I'll never forget the first time I went to the night watch and realized that these young men and women were sacrificing daylight hours of their life so they could sleep to be able to wake up and worship Jesus in the night. And that honestly changed my life. It helped me have a new understanding of what true devotion was and what it really means to, to be a living sacrifice. Over the years, I've gotten to know many of you, many of you I'm blessed to call friends. Um, I've been here for a couple of historical moments. I was actually at the last One Thing conference, got to worship in the tents with you guys on the Truman property for the Send. So again, it is a little awkward to be up here now kind of as a professional spokesperson, but it's also a high honor. It's a high honor to serve your leadership team, and to also serve you guys. I take it very seriously. On a personal level, I'm not a stranger to the pain of trauma, and I can actually identify with the alleged victims in this case. I also know what it's like to be falsely accused. I was wrongfully imprisoned in a foreign country when I was 27 years old. And that's what led to the work that I do today. That story has been well chronicled in books and movies. Um, 
But there's only really two relevant points for what I'm going to share today. And the first is that when I was in prison, our Lord Jesus found me. I dedicated my life to him and became free behind bars. And secondly, I found myself thrust into this international crisis of politics and private interest and dishonest journalists, media frenzies, a corrupt judicial system, the White House, backroom meetings, even a missile deal. My family and friends fought tirelessly for me. The emotions, the exhaustion, the contextual drivers, the peripheral issues, the waves of trauma, the fear, spontaneous volunteerism. When your body goes numb, I'm sure a lot of you have felt that in the last couple of weeks. Watching people that don't even know you debate about who you are in the media. How one social media post can change everything in a narrative. When millions of people believe one thing about a case, and millions of people believe the exact opposite about the same case. But there's only one truth. How does that happen? After my experience, it led to what today is called the David House Agency. We specialize in solving complex matters and uh, have had the honor to work around the world on matters ranging from international adoption and custody disputes, parental kidnapping cases, protecting the persecuted church, freeing pastors from wrongful imprisonment, combat combating human trafficking. We work with some of the largest law firms in the world, and we regularly involve trauma specialists and therapists for aftercare and guidance. One time, our team flew to the Middle East 20 times in 24 months to free a Chinese-American couple that were wrongfully imprisoned. And that case alone was featured in the New York Times over 12 times. The complexities of some of these crises are beyond my comprehension but the Lord is faithful and he will bring relief. So my point isn't to impress with a resume, it's just to communicate that I've been here in different ways before. And I can honestly tell you that in some ways I feel like I can identify with all sides of this story. So what does a crisis manager do? First of all, I'm not here to clean up anything. I'm here to help IHOP get to the heart of this matter. And I'm on this stage on behalf of the International House of Prayer as an organization. But I've also made it crystal clear that I'm not going to participate in anything except an honest, thorough, and Christ-honoring pursuit of the truth. There is no other way. <laughs> Only the truth will set this situation free. Practically, my job is to come alongside your leaders and help shorten the learning curve. I want to be very clear that I'm not a decision maker. I'm here along with many other outside experts, excellent experts that are uh, in your midst. I'm here to provide support and recommendations to your leadership. So stepping forward to communicate on behalf of the client is often part of what is needed, and I will do that with the utmost integrity and honor that I know how to. So that's a little bit about me. Again, it's not to impress with the resume. It's just to come to a common ground with you guys. So uh, I'd like to get right to work. Is that OK? OK. I'm going to start with a summary timeline. It's not going to be exhaustive, but it should serve to put some things in perspective. There are some facts that might be triggering for some people, but we must face the facts. We must start with facts in order to avoid wrongful conclusions. As a quick illustration, a bad detective starts with a theory, and then he goes to find facts and evidence to support that theory, as opposed to a good detective who looks at facts and evidence and lets that inform his or her theory. The bad detective 
is the one that results with false accusations. So facts matter, and the sequence in which they are examined matter too. There's been some debate about dates and timeline, but I can state without any doubt that from an organizational and community standpoint, this crisis commenced on October 24th. On that day, a group of men claiming to represent a group of alleged victims for the first time presented a complete set of allegations, including details of one sexual abuse allegation from 26 years ago against Mike Bickle. That was a Tuesday. Within 48 hours, the executive leadership team met with Mike and asked him to step away, to leave room, to examine the facts, and verify the allegations. This was the right thing to do. A quick side note, I'm using the word step away instead of step down because, and I know there's nuance here and I get that, but Mike hasn't formally been a part of this organization for almost three years. He wasn't on staff and he wasn't part of the org chart. So that's why we're saying step away. Again, forgive me, but my job is to be precise and clear. There's been a lot of assumptions, there's been a lot of nuance, um, and I think that's caused some confusion. So formal allegations came in on a Tuesday, and Mike was benched within 48 hours, and none of you have seen him since then. Two days after that, the following Friday, the ELT made the allegations public on this very stage for the first time. And I know that for many of you, that was a day that marks a before and after. And again, that is completely normal, considering uh, how interwoven this community is. That was on a Friday. The very next day, a group that's been referred to as the Advocate Group released a written statement stating that they had found allegations of clergy sexual abuse by Mike Bickle to be credible and long-standing. That same day, the media picked up the story and the headline ran around the world within 24 hours. Two days after that, on October the 29th, Sunday, the ELT announced that they were engaged with outside parties to help assess the situation. Just one week later, following Sunday, November 5th, the ELT announced that they had engaged Stinson LLP to conduct an impartial examination of the allegations. That was less than two weeks after formal allegations were presented to IOPKC. One post on social media claiming that Stinson was actually a threat to the alleged victims started a conversation that, with all due respect, was ill-informed. And it's probably the primary reason we're having this conversation here today. One social media post had that effect. Stinson is a national law firm who's recognized for their work representing victims of sexual abuse. But that fact seemed to be overlooked. The advocate group also communicated a lack of trust. And so knowing that they would likely not participate less than a week later, on November 10th, the ELT announced that they would not be proceeding with Stinson. And they engaged a local attorney who was going to start with the simple step of interviewing alleged victims. Again, I'm not a pastor, forgive me, but I'm speaking very carefully and very clearly. This is not how I would talk for in a normal conversation. <laughs> the 
This local attorney is known in the IHOP community. She's well respected in the legal community. She's extremely professional. And she was involved in the founding of an anti-human trafficking organization. But the advocate group and people associated with the advocate group complained that this local attorney could not be impartial. And they refused to speak with her or respond to her letters. Meanwhile, there was sort of what felt like a pressure campaign for IHOP KC to hire a Christian investigative firm called Grace. The advocate group on that Tuesday the 24th, the day that complete allegations were formally presented, the advocate group on that day actually demanded that the ELT hire Grace to conduct an internal investigation. But then IHOP later discovered that the main alleged victim was using the founder of Grace, who is currently a primary board member of Grace, as her private attorney. And this immediately disqualified Grace as a candidate to conduct an impartial investigation. So the ELT, they went back to the drawing board. Meanwhile, they're being bombarded by emails, text messages, accusations, crisis. I mean, they have full-time jobs. Ironically, when I first came here, I was shocked at how busy all of you are. I thought in my mind, it's an intercessory ministry, but you guys are so busy doing good work. So imagine three additional full-time jobs on the ELT. So they went back to the drawing board. Now again, the feelings and questions about what the ELT was or wasn't doing during this time is understandable. It was extremely challenging for them to know what to share, when to share, what they could share, and this did lead to an information void that was filled with a narrative that came from the outside. While all this was happening, IHOP Casey's attorneys conducted their own examination of the allegations based on the information that had been provided to them by the advocate group. So let me just give an analogy. Imagine someone comes to your house, knocks on the door, and tells you, you have to replace your roof. And here's the contractor you have to use to replace the roof. Obviously, you would say, well, can I at least verify there's a leak first? This organization has a sovereign right to verify there's a leak. We're not opposed to replacing the roof, but can we just verify there's a leak? That was the dynamic during that time period. And that's why the ELT wisely engaged attorneys to conduct an internal review. So on November 16th, a report on initial findings was published. I want to repeat, it was simply a report on initial findings. It's not in any way an exoneration of Mike Bickle. It was just an examination of the information that had been provided at that time. If any of you have not read it, I would encourage you to go and read it today. You can find it on the IHOPKC website. Less than a week later, after the report on findings was published, the ELT announced that they were engaging with additional third parties who would be candidates to come in and do an outside investigation. IHOP KC attorneys even traveled to Washington, D.C. to interview one of the investigative firms that everyone online was, was demanding be hired. So to be fair, what may have appeared to be slow rolling or, an actual, really, or, or a slow moving process and actually is just the reality of the workload, the time it takes to properly assess these service providers, the way they work, their terms of engagement, there are very real cost involved with this process. A lot of this is unprecedented for this organization. It can even take easily a week just to get one of these contracts signed. It's important to note to me, especially as believers, because I, 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 as I've been getting up to speed, 
Oftentimes, acting with wisdom and integrity, sometimes it prevents you from moving really fast, as fast as everyone wants you to go. And I can say that from what I've seen, your executive director, Stuart Greaves, he's been cautious, he's been prudent, he's been measured, he's been very fair, maybe even too fair. And that has not been easy, and it has even led to many to believe in false allegations against him. So again, we realized the communication during that time maybe wasn't what everyone had wanted, but I hope that providing you with even just this basic summary could bring a little bit of clarity. So now I have some good news. Today is December 10th. And I'm naming dates because all the armchair investigators are in line are going to be picking all this apart. <laughs> Today is December 10th, and IHOPKC has engaged a new third party to conduct an independent and impartial investigation. One more time. IHOP has engaged a new third party to conduct an independent and impartial investigation. What does that mean? Let me tell you a little bit about this firm. The firm has extensive experience conducting independent investigations into high profile cases across the KC metro area, including cases of clergy abuse allegations. They are highly sought after due to the skill and thoroughness by which they conduct investigations. And I think most importantly, in this case, they are trauma-informed. What that means is they're trained in how to interact with people who are traumatized, with survivors of abuse. They know how to ask questions in ways that won't re-traumatize uh, uh, the subjects. IHOPKC does not control this investigation, meaning it has no ability to dictate the process or the outcome. While IHOP is shouldering the financial burden, the investigators will operate completely independently. The investigators have already started. IHOPKC has turned over its documents. The investigators are in contact with the advocate group and all the known alleged victims. Everyone's going to say, how long is this going to take? Honestly, the length of time it takes depends on several factors. But the main one is going to be whether or not the alleged victims and the parties involved in representing them are willing to participate. We hope they, they will participate so the truth can be brought to light quickly. Since they have already started the investigation, their identity is not secret. However, IHOPKC will not be publicizing the names of the investigative firm, the lead investigator, or members of the investigative team in order to avoid any interference with their ability to conduct the investigation. There is an extraordinary amount of um, internet behavior activities. I'll be very respectful. Unfortunately, it has created an atmosphere where certain people that are, that are, that are serving uh, IHOP, it's better for them to remain anonymous. Again, their identity is not secret. It has been made known to the alleged victims and the parties representing them. So to be clear, neither the investigator nor her firm have ever had any ties to IHOPKC or any relationship with the involved parties. Again, I know some of this terminology is uncomfortable, but I have to be technical. Uh, there is an important audience that goes beyond just the people sitting in this room. And that's not all. Um, your leaders have been working around the clock, and they are planning to go beyond a third party investigation. IHOPKC and its board of directors are building out what will be called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This commission will include an advisory panel of outside leaders 
a thorough examination of everything that has taken place here. There will be human resources experts, pastoral programs, regular community meetings, and much more. The details of that project will be shared publicly in the near future. But I can say that from what I've seen and what has been voted on by your board of directors, IHOP cares about sound oversight, accountability, and is open to improvement. The gift of crisis is what it can teach. And I can say that your ELT and this board of directors is not only willing, but eager to make improvements. So in closing, uh, I know there are many things uh, that people want to know. There are many questions that people have. And I know that I didn't address that today. We will be addressing as many of those questions as we can in the coming days through various channels. And this crisis is not just being experienced at an organizational level. Crisis doesn't stop there. From what I understand, it really has permeated every caveat of this community, working relationships, friends, businesses, households. But I want to encourage you that what many of you are experiencing are normal symptoms to an abnormal situation. They're normal symptoms to an abnormal situation. It's normal to feel this way considering the circumstances. It's not nice, but it's also temporary. Time will have its way. The Lord will have his way. It's important to communicate your feelings to each other respectfully, and don't let it get stuck inside. That will corporately help this body stay healthy and minimize the damage and the healing that needs to happen in the future. In this particular case, the truth will be established. God loves this house too much. The truth is going to bubble up. Come what may, it's going to come out. So on behalf of IHOPKC, I ask for patience so this process can be executed properly and responsibly. And now, uh, the best for last, um, members of this community, International House of Prayer, it's time to keep doing what you do so well. It's time to pray. We ask for your prayers. You guys are all stakeholders in this, just as much as the ELT and anyone else. No matter how we look at this, with all due respect to anyone on any side of this, there is a spiritual war. There is a spiritual war. Hold firm for the Lord. This will pass, and it's going to be OK. Thank you. Let's go ahead and stand just before the Lord. We're going to conclude our service here for this morning. We will get to messages and themes of Advent next week. <laughs> Father, here we are during this sobering time. And Lord, we need your help. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. We want all things to come to light. We want the power of the cross to be made evident. Lord, we want there to be repentance, restoration, reconciliation, prayers, Lord, the purifying of our own heart, Lord, the searching of our own heart and our own lives and examining them in light of the gospel and the cross. We love you, Jesus. We love this season that highlights your coming into the mess of our lives. We love this season in the remembrance of you. We honor you, Lord. We bless you. We ask Lord, for mercy for all involved in this. Mercy would abound. The power of God would abound. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be formally dismissed. God bless you all.